I'm Edwin Peeler. I go by the name Ed or Coach, or they call me Fesser. I spent 39 years in education, uh, teaching, and coaching. Uh, my family has lived in Cleveland County since the mid 1700s. Uh, I have done some genealogy. Uh, the Peelers came from Germany by way of England to Philadelphia, and then from Philadelphia down to Salisbury. From Salisbury to Cleveland County, two bro three brothers came from Cleveland County. Uh, two stayed in the Bellwood Kaiser area, and one went to uh, Gaffney, that is the Derry Peeler family, uh, and the Lieutenant Governor of South Carolina right now, I think. Uh, my mother's side, the Whiteners, came from Germany also uh, by way of England and came on the same boat that the Peelers came on, but about 10 years later. And they came into uh, Philadelphia at the same port, but they came into South Carolina, they were gold miners. And they came into here and then came into North Carolina to look for gold. And they became textile workers, the Whiteners did. The Peelers became farmers. So that's basically it. My immediate family moved, to, my relatives moved into the Kayser area and then my grandfather was a dentist. Uh, he moved to Shelby in 1911 and set up a dental practice. And in that process, he, during the depression years, he had enough money and back, backing to buy quite a bit of farmland that was uh, bankrupt. And uh, he, my daddy ended up uh, running the farm for him. And you're looking at the textile part. My mother, my mother's father, my grandfather on her side was a mill superintendent at the little mill. And my mother started working in the mill in the office uh, when she was 13 years old. And she lived there, uh, worked in the office until uh, she retired at 65. And in that process, we had seven children. Mother had seven children, six boys and a girl. And uh, that pretty well sums it up. I coached for uh, 32 years uh, with athletic director at Crest High School for 31 years. And somebody mentioned it, and if I, we had a peeler, my immediate family, brother or sisters, playing on the Shelby High School athletic teams for 21 years, from 1951 to 1972. Your mother and Earl Scruggs overlap at the Lily Mill? Right. They did? Yeah. Well, it sounds like you said farming and uh, and textiles. These are the two big themes of Cleveland County's history in the 20th century. Probably. It certainly is. Yeah. Uh, the the text the textile part. My grandfather moved in here when the Shanks opened up the Lily Mill. Uh, the Shank family brought him up here from Clover, South Carolina, where he worked in a mill down there. And he became one of the fixtures that uh, Fred Whitener uh, became one of the fixtures in the Little Mill. Uh, and I said, Mother worked there from the time she was 13 years old until she uh, she did take some time off to have children, but uh, she worked there until she t retired at 65. We've been trying to get a, a picture of life in those mills and the mill towns, who who the people were who did those jobs what kinds of jobs those were compared to what they had before. Uh, what we understand is that it was a, it represented a wave of prosperity and working class jobs that paid pretty well, let people buy um, phonographs and home appliances and things for the first time. Is that about right? Can you talk about that? I think so. I think mean, Little Mill uh, was known for, for sewing thread and yarn. and. Uh, uh, I spent one night working in the mill down there, and I said I wasn't going to work down there anymore. Anyway, uh, the mills, you had mill villages, mill hills, uh, lint heads, uh, as they were called. Uh, most of the mill villages around here, the owners of the mills built houses, and you lived in those houses rent-free uh, if you worked in the mill. And uh, later on, I think they, I understand the Dovers started charging a dollar per room rent but if you worked in the mill. But uh, they had the three shifts that uh, came in. You had a dope, dope wagon in, in the mill, went through selling drinks. Uh, people that lived on those mill hills uh, lived there all their lives and uh, until 
the cotton gave out in Cleveland County. Bow Weevil came in here and, and destroyed the cotton. PPG and fiber came in here and opened up in, the, in 1959-60. And uh, they started hiring the people that were working on the uh, farms, uh, the laborers on the farms began to work in the PPG and fiber. And that sort of ended, began the downfall of the cotton industry and the textile mills in Cleveland County. It was the most concise story of the whole situation that we've heard. That the was, what now? I said that was the most concise and, and brilliant history in, in, in one, in two minutes. <laughs> okay. That was the condensed version. All Absolutely right. marvelous. Um, there's so many directions we could go. While we're on the textiles, I'd like to hear the, I'd like to hear Ed's take on what we've been hearing about the, the mill sponsoring Bolton. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, each textile mill in this area in the county had a, uh, had a baseball team. And, uh, uh, you had to work in the mill or, or to play on. Sometimes you, it all depends on what league they were in. Uh, you had to work in the mill in order to play on the team. But that was a way for young guys coming out of high school and coming out of college uh, to have a summer job. Uh, I know my high school coach, Lloyd Little, played on the Cleveland Cloth Mill team. He played, he was an All American baseball player at Lenore Ryan College, and they brought him down here in the late 30s to play on the Cleveland Cloth uh, baseball team. And they eventually went to some kind of a uh, national playoff. But a lot of the very prominent uh, men in Cleveland County that had played in, uh, in college, uh, played baseball in college, played on those mill teams, whether they worked in the mill or not. Most of them worked in the mill. When I was in high school, several of the mill teams had a flag football team. And later on in the 60s, those baseball teams became fast pitch uh, softball teams. And I, uh, I actually caught, uh, uh, was a catcher for a bunch of the guys that played with the Dover Mill when I was in, in, in college. And uh, for, for four or five years, I played fast pitch softball. You not only had the men, you had later on, I know when I was in high school too, this would have been in the early 50s, the mills had basketball teams for both men and women. And they played, uh, when the park opened up, uh, City Park opened up out there, the, uh, the, the mill teams played out there. They'd have their, play two nights a week at the park. And uh, they had some good basketball, good baseball in this area. Uh, and you sit around in these golf shops with these older men that come in there and sit around in the mornings. I work in a golf shop, so I'm, I hear it every day. That's all they talk about. They go back and talk about the baseball players and how good they were in the, in the 50s and 40s. And, you know, who could throw the hardest pitch? Who could hit the farthest ball? You hear those stories sitting around in the golf shops now and in the barber shops. Did the, did the games attract uh, the, the town Folk, I mean, was it well attended? Well, most every mill had a had a field, and it, just those people that lived in that mill area came to the ball games. Uh, Little Mill had a field, Shelby Mill had a field, Cleveland Cloth Mill had a field, Dover had a field. Uh, those areas all grown up now with uh, with houses and things of that nature, but. Uh, each mill had its own feel. And not only here, but Lincoln County, the teams here would go into Lincoln County and Burke County and play the mill teams up there too. How else did the mill companies um, sort of try to create light, you know, lifestyle things for their workers to do? I know uh, in the Little Mill area, my grandparents about every Friday night uh, at the old uh, South Shelby School, I, forget, I guess it's South Shelby School, that was the name of it, they uh, they had a musical, and just people in the mill village would go in there and they'd sing or gospel singing or, or whatever they could come up with, just a fun night. And I'd also remember going back to Don Gibson too. Uh, Don Gibson worked in the Little Mill uh, and lived in the Little Mill village. And on Friday nights and Saturday nights, uh, Ollie Moore had a fish camp down on the Broad River below Boiling Springs. And every Friday and Saturday night, he cooked fish, and people from the mill village and in that area would go down and eat fish and uh, and and square dance to some of Don Gibson and other people's music. 
And I think, but as far as I remember, that you go to Lawndale, the mills up there had the same thing. Uh, uh, they have a night or once a month or once a week where the families in that area could come together. And Little Mill, I remember, had a kindergarten. And I, I, were, I went to that kindergarten when I was a kid growing up before I started first grade. I don't know whether any of the other mills had that or not. So the mills uh, seem to take it on themselves to kind of take care of their employees and give them a full life. Yep. And that's very interesting because you know, companies wouldn't do that now. You also, uh, they're talking about uh, Dover Mill, the Dovers, and the Shanks at the Little Mill, I know, started churches too. And uh, you had the uh, South Shelby, uh, well, it wasn't South Shelby, Lafayette Street Methodist Church and Little Mill Baptist Church. And you got the Dover Mill Baptist Church over there. Dover Mill, the Dovers also started a school over there uh, in, their, in their mill village. It eventually became part of the Shelby school system. Were the, were the, the heyday of the mills uh, a, a draw for people from all over the place? Did the population of this area grow as a result of all those, those jobs? I don't know if the population grew. The population didn't really grow much until PPG and Fiber moved in here, I think. Now, I, you'd have to check some figures on that. But, uh, uh, I'd love to hear a little more about your career in coaching, what you coached, and what you learned about the area's interest in sports through those years. Well, I came through in the, in the 50s, 1951, 55. I played, played uh, basketball and baseball at Shelby High School, football manager, and then went to Gardner Webb Junior College and did the same thing there, and then transferred to Appalachian, but in the process, I went out for the ball clubs up there, but it wasn't quite good enough. Anyway, I spent uh, 12 years coaching baseball at the old Boiling Springs School, which was called Crest at uh, Boiling Springs. Uh, we won two state championships, 1A baseball championships there. I went to Crest, the new school, in 1967, and uh, that was the first year of Crest. It was the first year of total integration in Cleveland County. It was the first year of uh, integration in Cleveland County. And uh, I'll have to admit, I th I won't, I'll, I'll brag on myself to some extent, but that those first three base basketball teams at Crest had three, four very good black basketball players that were also very good people. And I think that probably helped integration at, in, at Crest High School anyway, uh, as much as anything in Cleveland County. Uh, David Thompson was on those teams. Uh, he ended up being playing basketball at North Carolina State. Ended up as the Player of the Year in uh, in college basketball twice. And when he signed a professional contract, he was the highest professional athlete in the United States. He ended up playing seven years in pro ball and uh, with Denver. And uh, uh, sadly to say, he got on drugs and uh, he uh, ended up shortening his career. He has since straightened himself out, and uh, he lives in Charlotte, and is, is doing very well. And oddly enough, he went back to state, I want to think, six or seven years ago, and graduated with his daughter. Uh, the same year his daughter graduated from state, he graduated with her. Uh, I spent uh, 32 years coaching uh, basketball, uh, 31 years as athletic director. Uh, I had two, two state baseball championships, 1A, had two uh, state Western North Carolina championships in basketball. And oddly enough, we were undefeated when David was a senior, went to play Salisbury for the state championship and got beat by three points. They played a boxing one on David and he didn't get to score as many points as he had. But that, I had a very, very outstanding coaching career, uh, enjoyed it, had good people to work with, good people to work for had good athletes. Um, in that period of time, I had 44 kids sign athletic scholarships to college. Had two college All-Americans, uh, three high school All-Americans, had five guys that ended up playing pro ball. Four in baseball, one in basketball. That's pretty much it. <laughs> what, what did you learn about uh, the kids themselves over the years and their interest in staying in Cleveland County or, or their engagement with uh, 
with the with the count with Cleveland County history. You know, I'm just curious whether you saw changes in in there. Now the young people that I taught and the years that I taught uh, were mostly from farm families, from textile families in the area rural. Uh, most of those kids' parents had been living here all their lives, working in the mill, working on the farm. And these kids didn't have a uh, big desire to go anywhere else. Oh, we had a few. I had, uh, I think, about six or seven young men who became doctors. Uh, but they had that, uh, that desire to do something different from what they, their family was doing. But basically, most of them stayed around here. I do keep up with a lot of my uh, former players now and even some of the former students that I see. I have a hard time recognizing some of them, but the <laughs> it's, uh, it's fun to run into them. And I run into them every day, up and down the streets here in town. But it's, uh, I don't know, Cleveland County, uh, it's sort of like the, the city of Shelby says, city of pleasant living, but you talk to people in Cleveland County and Shelby, they, they like it here. I mean, they like to raise their children here. It's a good place to raise kids. I've got a son, uh, he's here in Cleveland County. He was teaching, he got out to do something differently, but. Uh, my daughter-in-law is principal at Jefferson uh, Elementary School right now, but uh, so it, it's been a good place to live. Well, I, I can do two things. I know when you had you had one you had one black school in Shelby, Cleveland. You had four or five black schools in in the county. Uh, the integration process started, I, want, I think, 1964 when the Freedom of Choice came in. And we were in the first process of consolidation then at Crest at Boiling Springs. Uh, Lattimore, Mooresboro, and Boiling Springs had gone together as a school. The three, the other schools in the district, each three schools became one. Anyway, uh, Crest at Boiling Springs had five black students, two boys and three girls when uh, Freedom of Choice came in. One of those boys played basketball. One of the girls played basketball. Shelby was pretty much the same way because we played them. They had maybe a handful of, uh, of black students in from the city. And I think we had one kid, I think, trying high school up in the mountains, had a young man about 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, on a Hawthorne Wingo, and ended up playing for New York Knicks. Uh, he was the first black kid in this area to play any athletics, as far as I can remember. Uh, we had to play them, and uh, we did beat them one time. But anyway, uh, 67, when we consolidated all the schools in the county, then that was the first year of total integration also. And I think, as I said earlier, that uh, the Crest went through this process without hardly any trouble and I have, I have to think it was because of the uh, because of the black churches in the area meeting and, and, and working with those kids because of, you had to, I don't remember exactly how many black faculty members we had, but we had quite a few. And uh, we had some very good black teachers that came into our school and, and worked at Crest. And uh, Shelby had the same thing when they consolidated with, with the old Cleveland school. And I, I, I can't say that we had any real problems in Shelby or Cleveland County at the, at the, in the integration process. Oh, we have a fight every now and then in the cafeteria, but usually it was two black girls and more than anything else. It wasn't a black and white. Do you remember people having to go through kind of a, uh, you know, Shelby's white community having to go through sort of a, a thought process at least, so, you know, kind of thinking about what the past had, had really meant and saying, well, let's make it different? I'm sure, uh, I have to admit that uh, uh, my daddy was a segregationist, I mean, with the farm and all that, and took, taking care of the, uh, the uh, tenant farmers, which most of them were black. We had a few tenant white families, but uh, uh, my daddy pitched a fit when they started talking about integration in schools. He why don't you get out? That was it. Why don't you get out? You don't need to be doing that. But I didn't have any problem. I, uh, when I worked out on the farm, I, I worked with the with the blacks. I quite often would go sit down at the table and eat eat dinner with them when we was working and baling hay or doing something of that nature. I really didn't have that much that much trouble uh, with the integration. I, I, I'm sure there was a mindset, but uh, I was in the county, 
and uh, I, I didn't have that much to do with the city schools. At that time, the city schools were separate from the county schools. All right. Yeah, uh, I, I'll go your back to is, go back to the integration. What? I said your mama was church and Uh I will say I'll go back a little bit and talk about the uh, some of the black families. I, and, and it has changed. The black families have changed in the last fifteen, twenty years. Most many of the young black boys, black men that I had playing ball for me, lived with grandparents. And the grandparents took care of them. Uh, you don't have that today. I was talking to one of my former players on the telephone about a month ago. He he coaches in South Carolina now, and he was talking about the, in a predominantly black area, and he talked about the trouble that they have down there. And I said, "Well, you, what's what's the problem?" He, and his comment was, "Well, you coach, you were my daddy. Uh, I live with my, my grandma. There are no grandmas anymore." Now that could be because of the drug situation. It could be because of the that uh, what do you call that boomer group, the age group. But he says just not your grandmas and grandpas anymore to take care of kids, black kids, and that may be part of the problems in the schools too. Churches had a big deal. I know I, I could talk about David Thompson. David Thompson went to church every Wednesday night and every Sunday. His mom and dad just made him go. And the black churches, I, 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 I'll be honest, I go, I have been to quite a few black churches, visit, uh, gone to funerals, weddings. Uh, they, they are, they have their good time. It's a, their living is, is a, a joy at the church. They have a good time. Somebody in my Sunday school class one day said something about a church up toward Popeville, uh, a non-denominational free spirit uh, Jehovah's Multi-Millennium Church, you know. I said, where is it? It's up there on the right in the big curve as you get out of Pokeville. So I've got a place up in the mountains. One Sunday I was coming back from the mountains, and I just said, wow, how many churches are on this road? I started counting them. Most of them are, are Jehovah's Witness and Baptist churches. There's two Methodist churches on the road. I don't know how many Baptists, but every little nick and corner on, on the road you've got a church. And you, you want, I wonder why, you know, when you... I guess somebody in that little community just goes out and starts a church. You got a little church down the street here next to Shelby High School, a little non-denominational Baptist church. You go out there on Sunday morning, there might be six, seven cars there, and that's it. Well, church sounds like one of the things that's been an absolute constant in this area, yeah. no matter how far back you go. Yeah. Right. Have you seen them affect day-to-day -day life? How do you how do you expect that you, that you've seen that? The, these communities of faith just influence the way people are in Cleveland County? I, it has to have an effect uh, with the type of style of living we have in Cleveland County. Uh, you, I, I don't know. I'm going to have to say the last four or five years there seems to be more shootings and things in Cleveland County than I've ever seen. But uh, churches are trying to, I know I'm a Methodist and we, we work with the, some of the people in the area where my church is and some of the ch uh, other churches there. Uh, the Baptists have just built a home uh, type thing out on the edge of town for, for uh, people who are, I won't say homeless. Uh, a multi-religious group has taken over the homeless shelter uh, this is all being done through religious organizations. The churches feed the homeless on during the week and on the weekends. Presbyterians do it. Methodist, Baptist at churches. It's just uh, it's it's just part of our lifestyle. Are you are you uh, optimistic about um, the new generations growing up here and about the prosperity of the area? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic here in this area. That with, uh, economically, it's a slowdown, but uh, we've got a new paper company coming in. We've got uh, uh, the uh, Cleveland County uh, uh, 
park over at Kings Mountain. And I heard her talking, I think, uh, when I came in. Uh, it's, a, it's a shame that you look around Cleveland County at all the mills that are closed. They're empty. I don't know. It probably costs too much money to renovate them to make them into something. But uh, it, every, every one of the big textile mills that was here in the 50s, 40s, and 50s are closed and empty. But I think the prospects are good here in Cleveland County. It, uh, it, once this economic situation turns over and we've got, uh, got a little bit more jobs available, I think the economic, I mean, the uh, jobless rate right now is right at 10, 11 percent. Uh, it, it's got to get better, and I think it will eventually.